Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Everybody happy that we have air conditioning inside? This is that hot weather you guys have been telling me is coming. In case you've been in a cave for the last week, it is here, all right? It is upon us. I am a ginger. I feel like I get a sunburn when I walk from the car to the house, you know what I mean? Uh, it is hot out there. It is blazing out there. So thank the Lord for some uh, AC in here this morning. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're a first-time guest with us, my name's Brian. I'm one of the pastors here, and just happy that you're here with us. I'll add my word of welcome to Eddie's. I want to welcome those that are joining us online as well, and uh, just excited to continue on with the series today. Uh, before we jump into our message for today, I've got some big news and uh, some things that I'm, uh, or something I'm excited to tell you and a little bit sad to tell you at the same time. Um, so a couple months ago, a little family business here, a couple months ago, about three months ago to be exact, um, our worship leader who leads worship on Sundays for us, Gina Parr, um, who served here for almost 27 years. 27 years. Yeah, exactly. Let's celebrate that. It's been instrumental. Uh, she and Mark have done so much for our church in regards to worship. She said, Pastor Brian, she said, I just, I think it's time for me to retire. And, uh, and she said, we're not going anywhere. She said, and I love how she said, she said, this is our church and this will always be our church. We're here. She said, I just want to have some flexibility on the weekends to go visit my grandbabies. Um, I want to be able to help out with Mark a little bit more on the farm. And she said, so long as I'm holding the reins of the things up here in the front, um, it's harder for me to do that. She said, I feel like I've come to the point where I'm tired and I'm ready to just have a little break. And so um, we're excited for her in this new chapter. At the same time, it's sad uh, because we, we love Gina. Now, here's the good news. She's like, we'd still like to serve once a month. So she'll still be up here on the stage, uh, but uh, just, uh, just so you guys know, I want to keep you guys in the loop as to what's going on with our, with our staff and our, and our staff family, our church family. So um, when you guys see her next weekend, or if you maybe get a chance to give her a phone call this week, just take a minute and tell her thank you. She's done so much for us, and it's one of the things I shared with her when she was talking to me about this. I said, I said, we just want to be able to honor you in the best way possible. We want you to be able to make this transition the way you want to make this transition because you have done so much for this church. You have earned the right to do what you want to do at the end of this. And, uh, and I told her what it, kind of what I just told you guys, that we've just so appreciated um, the efforts and ministry over the past almost 27 years. So uh, take some time this week, tell her thank you. In that transition period, um, I actually was, I, I went and I talked to Pastor Chris, our discipleship pastor, and I said, hey, brother, would you, <laughs> would you be willing to lead worship for us kind of in this next little season uh, as we're looking for someone to replace Gina full time? And, uh, and he, he agreed that he'll be willing to lead the worship for us on the weekend. So you've, been, you've seen him up here before. He's led for us before, and so uh, I was really excited for that. So if you see him, tell him thank you too for stepping in and filling that gap, and uh, we appreciate all the work that Chris does. Um, we're going we're gonna to be looking uh, for a worship leader, and uh, so if you know anybody, please, you can drop their name to us. We've got a couple people that we're talking to um, presently, or one in particular, and, uh, and uh, we're excited about what God's going to do uh, in our worship ministry, okay? Now, with all that being said, I want you to mark your calendars for July the 28th, because if you know Gina, Gina does not like a big deal made about her. But I told her when she had this conversation with me, I said, Gina, whether you like it or not, we're throwing you a party, okay? Whether you like it or not. And I put it in my calendar on the spot, the Gina party. That's what it's in my calendar as, all right? So July the 28th, okay, after the 1030 worship celebration, July 28th, we're going to have a big party and we're going to celebrate her. We're going to have a meal together. We've got a special video, kind of a tribute thing. Um, we're going to have some different musicians come in that have played before, some different worship leaders. We're really excited about that big day to celebrate her. Um, and so congratulate her this week. Tell her thank you, and uh, just wanted to keep you guys in the loop on that. Does that sound good? Everybody say yes. Good. If you weren't here with us last week, we started a new series called Me and My Big Mouth, and we talked about how this is not uh, your neighbor's mouth, this is not your spouse's mouth, this is you and your big mouth, and how that throughout this series, as we talk about the tongue and the power that the tongue has, that we want you to draw a circle around your seat figuratively and assess yourself and see what you're doing with your mouth. And last week, we did some, some hand motions. If you weren't here, you really missed it, okay? Uh, there were some hand motions that went along with what we talked about. We said you need to be quick to listen, slow to speak. Let's try that together. You guys ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Quick to listen, slow to speak. 
And we talked about how that we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak because in an argument, in a heated conversation, in relationships in general, both parties want the exact same thing. They want to be heard and understood. They don't care about the lecture until they know that you've heard them. And so last week we agreed all together. You agreed because you nodded and said amen at the end of it, okay? You said you would try to be better at being quick to listen and slow to speak so that the other party can be heard and understood. Now, today we're going to look at another chapter in the book of James. If you want to go to James chapter 3, we're going to be there in just a minute. It, and he's going to give us another reason why we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Let me pray and we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for the power that is in it. Um, we're grateful for how the Holy Spirit leads us as we read and apply your word. And uh, so I pray as James uh, commanded us. He said, you need to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And so today, help us to be doers and not just hearers as we receive the word that you've given to us for today for our people. And uh, I pray, as always, that we would leave changed and not the same. God, restore relationships, uh, strengthen relationships with one another and with you as we learn to control our tongues in the way you've intended. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we begin today, I'm going to do something a little bit different, and I need a, uh, a volunteer. I need a really brave soul. Let me get a volunteer. Come on. This is like the, all right, come on up, buddy. This, that's like the moment when the, when the pastor's looking for someone to pray, all right, and no one wants to make eye contact with the pastor, okay? Well, let's give it up for, uh, for Eli. Come on up here, brother. You ready? Oh, no, we'll crowd you off there. Come on over. All right, so Eli, this is, actually, you know what? Here, let's stand right here. Come over here, buddy. All right, you ready? So uh, this, is a, this is an average run-of-the-mill tissue box. I've become very close with this in the last couple of months with my allergies. Uh, this has been my friend. Uh, but this is an average run-of-the-mill uh, Kleenex box, and I'm going to make it disappear. I'm kidding. I'm not going to make it disappear. I'm not a magician. But here's what I want you to do, Eli. I want you to pull out one by one, as fast as you can, every tissue in this tissue box, okay? You guys think you can do it, yes or no? Someone said no. <laughs> they don't have any faith in you, Eli. I have faith in you. I think, my little oh, was it? Okay. I think, I think you can do it. Okay. I'm going to hold the box, all right, and I'm going to time him on my watch. You ready? On your mark, get set, go. Go, 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 go. Wow, he's good. This guy's played some youth group games. Go, go, go. Go, go. I got the 200 count, so it'd take him longer. Go, 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 go. 15 seconds. Oh, all right, give it up for him. 15 seconds. Wait, how much is in there? 15 seconds. That was actually a record among all three services this weekend. So way to go, Eli. Yeah, we had one that took like 25 and one that took like four minutes, you know. So uh, it's good. Now, so the next step in this is I want you to take all these tissues <laughs> and I want you to put them back in there exactly as they were. Can you do that for me? Yeah. <laughs> All right, give it up for Eli. Thank you, buddy. Go ahead and you have a seat. See, the thing with the mess Eli just made for me up here with all these tissues is you can pull them all out, but there's no way that you can put them back in exactly the way they were, right? You know, we've been talking a lot about the tongue lately. We talked a lot last week about the, the way that we use our tongue and the way we respond to people in conflict and the way we respond to people in relationships. And, you know, our words are a lot like this tissue box. See, you can say something and you can get it all out, but you can never put it back in. Isn't that true? We can say it like this. Once your words begin, there's no putting them back in. Once your words begin, there's no putting them back in. And so James would tell us this is a big reason why we ought to be very careful with what we're doing with our tongues or with our words. Because we've all had moments when we've said something we wish we could just stuff right back in our mouths, don't we? You ever had that moment where you say, sure, I'll help you move, right? You ever done that? And you're like, oh, no, there's no going back. And you show up at their house, and there's boxes everywhere, and there's nothing in the boxes, right? They haven't even begun packing. Anybody ever experienced that? Yeah, that'll test your faith right there. That's what it'll do, especially as a pastor, right? You know, maybe it was a time whenever you were gossiping or talking about somebody, only to turn around and find the whole conversation you just had with someone else, the person you were talking about was within earshot. You ever had that happen? And you feel like crawling underneath a chair or crawling underneath the nearest object because you're embarrassed and you don't even know what to say next. How's the weather? You can't do that. There's no putting those words back in once they've come out. You know, maybe like last week, we talked a lot about arguments and heated conversations. Maybe it's a heated conversation that you were having with someone or an argument you had with someone that you love, and you said something so hurtful to them. You knew right where to jab them, and you said something so hurtful. And what's crazy is you knew that it would hurt them, 
And even though you knew it was going to hurt the person that you love, you said it anyway. Now think about that for a minute. Think about the wickedness that is in our hearts. Think about the pride in our hearts, the desire to be right, that we would actually jab and and malign and harm someone with our words that we love just to be right in an argument. And here's something we know, all of us know this is true. That person you love the most, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your children, those people that are close to you, the ones you love the most, you know exactly what buttons to push and exactly what words to say to cut them, don't you? And what's crazy is so often, we're we're going to talk about what James says about the tongue, but what so often happens with our tongues is that we use it to hurt people that we love the most. See, we might talk about other people that we don't care about in our workplace. We might talk about people in politics or talk about people on social media that we don't know, but we can make the most damage with our tongues to the people that are the closest to us. Isn't that nuts? That tells us a lot about the wickedness and the pride that lies in each of our hearts. And James is going to tell us, look, this is why. You've got to be quick to listen and slow to speak because there's no rewind button when it comes to our words. There is no rewind button when it comes to your words. If you're watching a ball game and your kids come in, guys, and they interrupt you, you can rewind and get back what you missed, right? You can rewind and get back what's already been put out on your television screen with your DVR, right? Or with the cloud, whatever the cloud is. I don't even know what that is, but there's, my TV shows are in there, right? Or the ball games are in there. When it comes to your words, there is no rewind button. The things that you say can actually be dangerous. The things that you say can harm others. And sometimes, James is going to tell us, the damage can actually be irreparable. You might think of a time in your life when someone has said something to you or about you, and it's hurt you so much, and right or wrong, whether you should be bitter or not, we know we probably shouldn't be bitter, right, as Christians, but we are. And those things linger with us. They stick in our minds because the things that we say, you can't put them back in. There's no rewind button when it comes to our words. Now, I told you to turn to James chapter 3. Look at verse 2 in James chapter 3. We'll have it on the screens for you as well. James chapter 3 verse 2 says, We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect. Everyone say perfect. Able to keep their whole body in check. Now, the first part of that verse is true for all of us. We all stumble, don't we? We all mess up. Any perfect people in the room? No, I doubt it. I really doubt it. Unfortunately, this side of heaven, there'll be no sinless perfection. You're not going to get to a point where you can control everything in this life, where you can have a handle on every single sin that you struggle with. So what James says, look, we're all messed up people. We all stumble, but the person who can control their tongue, he says, the one who's never at fault in what they say is perfect. Now, the word perfect there carries with it the idea of of mature or complete, okay? And he says, the person that's mature and complete that knows how to handle their tongue the right way, he says, actually, they're going to keep their whole body in check. Their whole life will be in check because they can keep the little thing inside their mouth in check. That's pretty heavy words, isn't it? Now, he continues. Keep going. You ready? James 3, 3. He gives us a couple illustrations to describe what he's talking about. And just, I'll just let you know, James is setting us up here, okay? Just be ready. He's going to drop the bomb on us. He's setting us up. Here we go. Uh, verse 3. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. How many of you guys own horses in the room? Let me see your hands. Anybody own horses? Anybody ever ridden a horse? Anybody ever seen a horse? The rest of you guys? That should have covered everybody, all right? Should have covered. I thought we'd have more people that own horses. Okay, that's okay. All right. We know horses. I am not really a horse riding person, okay? I don't like to ride on the back of things that have the ability to choose whether or not they want me on the back of them, okay? I I don't like that. My cousin, actually, when I was a teenager, my cousin was horseback riding, and she got thrown off and kicked in the head. At least that's what we think is what's wrong with her. Um, And... (laughs) It was just a true story, though. She did get kicked in the head, and it scared me. And so, like, I've always kind of been a little bit tentative when it comes to horses. But if you take a horse, James says, a horse is, you know, full-grown anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 pounds, depending on the type of horse, okay? These are giant animals. They outweigh us by far. But he says a person that's riding a horse can take a little five-inch bit and put it in that horse's mouth and can control the destination of that horse, can't they? It actually has the ability to affect the outcome of where that horse goes by a tiny little few ounce bit that is inside of their mouths. We know this to be true. Now, I have ridden a horse once or twice. Usually, it's someone leading me around on that horse, okay? But what what do you do? You hold the reins. What happens when you pull back on the reins because of the bit? What do they do? Come on, you guys. It's not a trick question. You ready? When you pull back, what happens? They stop, all right? When you do this and you say, giddy up, whatever that word means, what do they do? They go. What happens when you pull this way? What happens when you, James says that little tiny bit 
This tiny, seemingly insignificant thing that's inside the horse's mouth has the ability to control the entire 1,000, 2,000 pound body of this horse. Okay, you guys with me? Very clear. I love how clear and practical James is. Look what he says next. He gives us a second illustration that's extremely clear as well. He says, verse 4, or take ships as an example. Everybody say ships. Although they're so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So here's his second illustration. He says, you got the horse over here. This massive animal is controlled by a tiny bit. He says, let me talk to you about some ships for a minute, okay? He says, a huge ship can be steered by a tiny rudder. Now, if you were to go down to Charleston, South Carolina, near where I grew up, it's a few hours away. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever been there or not, but there's a lot of history in the waters there at Charleston. Um, one of the things they have in the water, actually cemented into place, is a decommissioned uh, aircraft carrier called the USS Yorktown. I don't know, anybody ever been there by chance? Just curious? Okay, a couple of people, good. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. I remember as a seven or eight-year-old boy, I was young the first time we went, and uh, I remember stepping out on the deck of that aircraft carrier. This thing is almost 900 feet long, weighs about 30,000 tons, not pounds, but tons. This thing is immense. It's massive. And they've got it sitting there in the harbor, and you can pay to go do a little tour. And I step out onto the top of this thing, onto the deck where all the planes would take off from, and I look around, and as this small seven or eight-year-old boy, I look and I think, how huge is this giant ship? And as you look at a giant ship like that, you think the giant parts on that ship are what really make the difference. And there's some truth to that. But here's the thing. James says it's the tiny rudder that determines the destination of that ship, isn't it? It's the tiny rudder. You might think it's the giant deck where the planes take off, which is a, it's a fruitful thing when you're an aircraft carrier, okay? It might be the giant satellite dishes on top that spin around and communicate with other people, other parts of the military. Yes, that's true. But without the tiny rudder that's underneath that ship, that thing will sit still where it's at. It'll have no course whatsoever. James says that tiny rudder controls, just like the bit in the horse's mouth, it controls the destination of that giant 30,000 ton ship. You guys with me? Say yes. Look what he says and what he compares it to. So he says, James is like, now, all of y'all, maybe y'all don't have a boat. Maybe you don't own a horse, but he's going to say, I'm going to tell you something every single one of you owns, okay? Look what he says in the next verse. Likewise, the tongue. Everybody say tongue. Yeah, the tongue's gross, isn't it? You have to brush it. You have to do mouth rinse. It's disgusting, isn't it? I actually was talking to someone after the first service, and they said they heard a pastor preach on this, and he brought a giant cow tongue up to the front. Are you guys glad I didn't do that, or should I have done it? I don't even know. I, I was like, I wish you'd told me before. I could have brought that thing up here. That would have been great. The whole tongue's disgusting, but he says, look, just like the bit in the horse's mouth, just like the rudder on the ship, the tongue might seem small. It might seem small proportionately, but it has great influence. Look what he says in the next part of the verse. Likewise, the tongue is a small, everyone say small, a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Everybody say great. Small part, great influence. It's not very big, but it can do some very big things. It's powerful. And I'd say this, did you know this? You are a powerful person. Every single person in the room. You are a powerful person. You say, ah, oh, Pastor Brian, I'm not powerful. Nobody cares who I am. I don't have any authority over everything, anything. People don't care what I say. No, no, no. James says, your tongue makes you a powerful person. The things you say affect other people. The things that have been said to you shape who you are. We could say it like this. The words you say affect others, and the words others say affect you. The words you say affect others, and the words you others say affect you. Now, think about it. Growing up. There were probably some things spoken to you or about you that shaped who you are in some ways, didn't they? they, they might have been a, it might have been a good thing. It might have been a coach that was really encouraging and said, I feel like you've got what it takes to make it on the NCAA level when it comes to basketball. That's what I always dreamt my coach would tell me. You know, <laughs> um, I, I was a big basketball player, and I always, I always wanted to play. I, I, I love it. I still love it to this day. It's just, you know, I'm, I'm more old than jock these days. You know what I mean? I'm just I'm out of shape, and it's, it, it's okay. It's dad life. It's okay. Well, I love basketball. Maybe it was a coach, though. And the coach said, you've got what it takes. And I, I just want to tell you, you have the skills. You've got some of those intangibles. You've got the ability to be able to go to the next level. And it inspired you to be able to go and do that. Maybe conversely, it was something negative, someone said, that still kind of rings around in your mind. Even years later, the words that they spoke have shaped you. They, might, they shape who you see when you look in the mirror. Uh, maybe it was a parent or a grandparent or a loved one that said something that was condescending or sarcastic to you. 
And that, that one or two comments that they made, because they knew you, and they knew the buttons to push, it cuts you so deeply that it's shaped who you've become today. It shaped how you see yourself. It shaped how you see the world. See, James says your words, this tongue in your mouth that creates words, he says they're powerful, and we've got to be careful with them. Now, you might say, well, Pastor Brian, I've had a lot of terrible things said about me, and I didn't let them affect me. I've been successful in, in my area of work. I've been successful in this area of my life. I've not let those negative things that were said to me affect me. Well, that can seem true on the surface, but here's the reality. A lot of times when some people say negative things to us, you got one of two reactions to that. One, it can cripple you, which is the more common one, unfortunately. The negative things that people say, they cripple you, they, they steal your confidence, and you don't go on to do what maybe you wanted to do with your life or whatever the situation might be. The other side of that is when someone says something negative to you and, and they're belittling to you or they're sarcastic or they're cutting and say, yo, you're not good enough, you're never going to make it at that, inside you, you almost subconsciously, subconsciously say, I'm going to prove you wrong, right? But here's the thing, regardless of which angle you take after that said, their words have still affected you. Their words were powerful being spoken over you. And James says, look, this is why you've got to be quick to listen and slow to speak. This is why you've got to be so careful with what you let cross these lips because it's influencing other people. He says it's a small part, but great influence. Now, the other thing to remember about our words to think about is that although all words are powerful, not all words are equal. Okay? Not all words are equal, which means it's easier to remember hurtful words and forget encouraging words. Isn't that true? See, you can have 10 compliments in a row and be feeling big, right? Like our egos are all inflated. We feel great. And one person can criticize what you're doing. And what does it do to you? You focus on the one criticism, don't you? There's something about the way that we are wired that it it, it takes so many more compliments or positives to counteract the negatives. Uh, The Harvard Business Review actually did a study back in 2013. They called it the praise to criticism ratio. And what they found is it actually takes six positive comments to counteract one negative comment. So think about the conversations you've had lately. Think about the number of negative things you've let come out of your mouth lately to people you love or maybe people you don't love. What the Harvard Business Review says, and they're way smarter than me, guys, all right? What Harvard says about it is that it takes six times as many positive things to counteract your one negative thing. And how your relationships look when you weigh them and you measure them against that. See, more than likely, what's what's easy for us, the, the easy path to take is to speak negatively, to speak sarcastically, to speak in a cutting way, especially to the people that we love. And James says, you've got to be careful. Because it's easy to forget the, the nice things that are said, and, 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 it, and it's, it's, it's hard to remember the good things that are said. Negative words, we can say it this way, the negative words that we say stay. The negative words that we say, they stay. And like I said a moment ago, you remember that time when your dad said that thing to you that hurt you so bad. Like when you lay your head on your pillow at night, sometimes it still rings around in between your ears. You th- you're processing it. Maybe it was a friend that was so close to you in high school or in college, or maybe it was a friend as an adult, and they said something to you that was so hurtful, and it's impacted you. It rings around in your mind when you lay your head on your pillow at night because the negative words that we say, they stay. James says your words are powerful. They have the ability to hurt other people. This is why it's so important for us to be quick to listen and slow to speak. And I would add this too. Who words come from matters. Who words come from matters. Know who you are to who you're speaking to. Know who you are to who you're speaking to. If you're a brother who your younger brother looks up to, this is the way it was when I was growing up. I had one brother. He was four years younger than me. He looked up to me immensely, right? One or two belittling comments can crush him. One or two sarcastic things said to him can crush him because he puts you on a pedestal. He put me on a pedestal. So if you're a brother in the room and that's the context you find yourself in, be careful with the words that you say because your words have a lot of weight. Listen, wives in the room, your words weigh a thousand pounds to your husband. They do. Now, he'll never tell you this. He'll never come out and say, honey, I just want you to say this nice thing to me. He'll never do that. But listen, our, we, we act, men, we act like our egos. We, we act like we're so big and tough, don't we? Men, say amen. All right, let's be real this morning, okay? I'll be real if you be real, all right? We think we're so big and tough, but our egos are so fragile. 
See, this is why whenever we're carrying the groceries in, right? This just happened this past week. We did a Walmart pickup, and we've got like 50 bags in the back of our, in the back of our Honda. And, I'm, I, and I want to impress my wife. And so when I go to carry the groceries in, I don't carry two bags at a time like a sane person. I carry all of them, right? And I come in and I poke my chest out like that, and I kind of strut in like this, and I don't put them down until she sees me, right? I know you men have done the same thing because we care what our wives think about us. We want their approval. And again, we're never going to go asking for it more than likely. But the things that you say to us, when my wife says, baby, you strong, right? (laughs) She doesn't talk like that. But if she did, if she were to say something like that, (laughs) if she were to say something like that, you know what that does for me? Man, I can fly for a week on that. You know what I mean? I can fly for a week on that. But the flip side of it's true as well. See, the the negative comments, the nagging comments, those things you say because you know exactly where to cut your husband, wives. You know exactly the thing, that place where he's messed up time after time again, those perceived failures, at least in your mind. You know exactly the buttons to push. And James says you've got to be careful with your words because who says the words really matters. I was listening to someone talk about this. He said that uh, dads, he said, dads, your words weigh the most. Your words weigh the most the most. And I see you guys nodding because it's so true. As you think back over your life, the things that your dad says to you, it just sticks. Whether that's a positive side of things or whether that's a, a negative side of things, there's something about the weight of a dad's word. So dad's in the room. Be careful with the things you say to your children. You might think, oh, I'm just being sarcastic. I'm just being funny. It's not funny. It's just not. Because everybody knows when it comes to sarcasm, there's a piece of truth in every piece of sarcasm, isn't there? We know it in our core that when someone's razzing us about something or being sarcastic about something, it might seem funny on the surface, but there's truth lying just underneath that surface. And so dads, if your words carry all that weight, if they carry all that responsibility, if, if, the way, if your, your children's future depends many times on some of the things that you say or don't say, how much more careful, men, should we be with our words? Amen? Who words come from? It matters. Now, look, look what he says next. James 3, 5, and 6 here. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. Now, where I grew up, we had commercials and we had billboards with Smokey the Bear on them. You guys have Smokey the Bear? Yeah. What did he used to say on the commercials? Only you can prevent forest fires, right? That was a blast from the past for some of us there for a minute. What did he mean by that? Well, he said, human beings, only you can prevent forest fires because most of the time, you're the one that starts the forest fire, right? And you, leaving cigarette butts into dry brush can start a blaze that goes on and destroys thousands of acres of forest. Leaving some embers burning in a campfire that you thought you almost put out. Those couple little embers can fly into a dry area and they can start a forest fire that can be devastating. And it can take years and years and maybe they never even recover. The area that gets burned down. And Smokey would say, only you can prevent forest fires. what James is getting at. He says, look, a great forest fire can be started with just a small spark of a word. It only takes a small spark to start a big fire. It only takes a brief amount of time with your words to make a big mess. But it can take years to clean it up. I'll say it this way. It takes less time to make a mess with your words than it does to clean it up. Isn't that true? See, we, we, can, we can pour it all out really quick and make a big old mess. It takes a whole lot less time to say it than it does to come behind and sweep it up, doesn't it? And so with our words, James says, be careful, be careful, be careful, because you have the potential to start a giant forest fire with this thing that lives behind your teeth, inside your mouth. He says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, because you have something very dangerous living inside your mouth. I mean, think about the last time that you gossiped about someone. Gossip is like the, the sin that we don't talk about in church because it's like on the minor list. You know what I mean? Like we got, we don't, we don't say it out loud, but we got like major list and minor list of sins. You know, you got like the, whatever, whatever your big one is over here and you got like gossiping over here. You got greediness and pride over here on the, on the like minor list. Listen, gossip can destroy friendships. Proverbs says a talebearer, a gossiper can destroy best friends. I mean, you can't get any more clear than that. Listen, the gossip that comes out of your mouth, let's be real honest as to what it is. See, when you gossip, what it is, is you feel insecure about your story, so you steal something from somebody else's story to make yourself feel better about your story. 
You guys with me? When you gossip, that is exactly what you're doing. And I know this is like a little bit heavy-handed, but it's something we got to talk about. James says we got to be careful with our tongues because there's a lot of power in it. The things you say, the gossip that you spread proves your insecurity, and it can prove hurtful and harmful for the person that you're talking about. Because think about the last time you gossiped. You had no thought about the other person's betterment, did you? You were only concerned about yourself and having something to talk about over coffee or having something to talk about when you got together with your bestie, right? Gossip has the ability to destroy. And I'm going to tell you, the messes that can be made because of gossip take far longer to clean up if they ever do get cleaned up than it took to speak the words out of our lips. Say amen. I know it's hard, but it's true. Think about the last time you were sarcastic. Think about the last time you were judgmental. The things that we just flippantly let roll across our tongues and come out of our mouths in our words, they have the ability to make a mess that can take years to clean up, that can permanently harm and permanently sever relationships. James says that's the power you've got in your tongue. That's the thing that lives inside of your mouth. Because it takes only a spark to make a big mess. Look what he says next, verse 6. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire. Your words have the ability to mess up your life. What you say has the ability to destroy your marriage and your friendships and your family. The things that come out of your mouth have the ability to destroy your life, to set the whole course of your life, James says, on fire. Look what he says next. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Pretty harsh words, isn't it? He says all kinds of animals, verse 7. Birds, reptiles, sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. He says, look, we've got a handle on all these other animals in the world. And he said, but there's one animal that none of you will ever fully tame. That's something to think about too. See, there's no magic prayer you can pray to fix your tongue. You're never going to get to a point where you're mature enough that it, no, nothing bad ever comes out of your mouth. You're going to hear in just a minute what he, how he further describes the tongue. But there, there's never a point at which you don't have to be on guard with this thing that lives inside of your mouth. James says that tongue is powerful. And though we've got birds of the world tamed, no man can tame the tongue. Look at what he says next. This is so important. Verse, the, uh, last part of verse 8. The tongue, it's a restless evil. Everybody say restless evil. Full of deadly poison. See, I told you you were powerful, right? I told you you were powerful. You're like that diamondback rattlesnake, right, that I'm afraid to come across out here, right? You're coiled up. Your tongue, James says, your tongue is coiled up and always ready to strike. It is restless. It's antsy in there, just waiting for an opportunity for you not to be filled with the Spirit and for you to just care about being right and to spew out some negative, deadly poison on the other person in the conversation. Isn't that true? See, your tongue, my tongue, he says, it's restless. It's just waiting for the chance to get out. It's got deadly poison laying back in its glands, ready to throw out. we got to realize the tongue, our tongues have the uh, consistent and constant ability to destroy. Our tongues have the consistent and constant ability to destroy, which is why we need to be quick to listen, slow to speak. Your tongue and the evil that can come from it never take a vacation. What he says next, he says, some of you guys act religious, but you say bad things in the next breath. Look, with the tongue, verse 9, we praise our Lord and Father. You act like you're religious, you're singing worship stuff. And with it, we curse human beings. There's negative things spewing out in the very next breath uh, for people that have been made in God's likeness. He says, you can't be sarcastic and cruel and then talk about how blessed we are and how good God is. You can't go gossip about someone and then break into the hallelujah chorus, okay? He said, that's not, na- he said, that's not normal. That's not natural. He says, these things ought not to be. Verse 10, uh, 10 through 12. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Everybody say, should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Yes or no? All right. My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree produce olives? Come on, not a trick question. You ready? Go. Yeah. Can a grapevine bear figs? No. Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. See, if you plant a fig tree, grapes aren't coming out of that fig tree. 
Only figs can come out of that fig tree if it's nurtured and, and nourished the right way. If you plant an apple tree, it's not going to produce oranges. It's going to produce apples. And so what James is saying, he says, look, your tongues have the ability to do something that nothing else in nature has. See, things in nature can only produce one thing. Your tongue has the ability to be extremely negative and sarcastic and cutting and biting and evil and full of that deadly poison. But it also has the ability to encourage and uplift and say positive things and speak over people. Now, I'll just give you a hint. Next week, we're going to talk about that, okay? We're going to come back. We're going to talk about the, the good things your tongue can do. So don't, don't go home and just like camp out on this message. Come back for next week. But James says, your tongue, he says, your tongue has the ability to be good and evil. But it's our choice. We've got to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Now, what's interesting is he just ends it right there. Like if you've re- you got your Bibles there in front of you, he goes right into a ne- the next part of the chapter on wisdom. And it's like, well, well just kind of left us hanging there, didn't you, James? Like, can you give it? You gave us the quick to listen, slow to speak in chapter one. What are we supposed to do here? Well, I'm glad you asked. Thank you for asking. I'm going I'm to tell you, okay? Everybody, everybody ready? You want to be told? Okay, good. I'm just making sure. All right, if you don't want to be told, we can go to Golden Corral. It's okay. All right, listen. All right. Here, here's what it means. Is Earlier, you know how it said, no human being can tame the tongue? See, what, what James is doing here is he wants us to be reminded of how powerful the tongue is that's inside of our mouth, how much destruction that it can cause so that we keep a check on it. There's no easy fix for the tongue. There's no permanent fix for the tongue. I said earlier, you can't mature out of it. You can't grow out of it. There's not a magic prayer or a magic formula that makes you not say negative things or not have the ability to say negative things. Things And so what I would think James would want us to do coming out of this, since he's given us all these truths about our tongue, he'd want us to do a couple of things, three things really. Consider and commit. Consider and commit. Consider the power that you have in your tongue. You don't often realize it, like I said a moment ago, but you are a powerful, powerful person. The words you say are powerful. You have a potentially deadly, powerful tool living inside of your mouth. And the words that we say need to be considered closely. Remind yourself of the potential danger that you have in your tongue. Remind yourself of what you could do to that relationship. Consider the damage. Consider the forest fire that could be started with one spark of me and my big mouth from you and your big mouth. James would say, consider it. The other thing I think he would say is commit. Commit your tongue every day to the Holy Spirit. Listen, the older I get, the more I realize you cannot white knuckle stuff when it comes to your Christian walk. You can't just try harder and hold on tighter. It takes a supernatural power of the Holy Spirit of God to change your tongue day by day. Because remember, no human can tame it. You, You can't fix it. But day by day, if we'll submit it to the Holy Spirit of God, He can fix it. He can help us moment by moment guard our tongue from letting those negative things come out of it. And as we're going to talk about next week, have some positive things come from it. James would say, consider, commit, right? Commit it to the Holy Spirit every day. This should be your prayer. Holy Spirit, help me to be quick to listen, slow to speak. Holy Spirit, help everything I say to honor you. Holy Spirit, help me to control my tongue. Holy Spirit, take control of my mouth today. See, these are things that we ought to be talking to the Holy Spirit about every day, every day, all throughout the day. Consider, commit, and then speak. And then speak. Close your Bibles. I want to I finish with this. A mentor of mine gave me some good advice a, a while back. He said, he said, lead others, Brian, the way you've been, le- or uh, the way you want to be led. To lead others the way you want to be led. He said, you've experienced good leadership. You've experienced bad leadership. He said, go and lead people the way you want to be led, right? Which is great advice. I think it's a great principle when it comes to any area of leadership that you find yourself in. Whether that's in your home, whether that's in your business, whatever that looks like. Lead people the way you want to be led. But I also think it's a great application when it comes to our tongue. See, we need to consider the power we have. We need to commit it to the Holy Spirit of God. But then we need to speak to others like we want to be spoken to. Speak to others the way you want to be spoken to. See, when you mess up and you blow your top and you get angry and you do something you shouldn't do, how do you want to be spoken to in that moment? I think James would say, speak to others the way you want to be spoken to. How do you want people to respond to you when it's you're the one to blame in the argument? When it's you're the one who's overspent, right? Or overdone something else. 
How do you want to be spoken to in those moments when you fail and when you mess up? I think James would say, look, consider, commit, and then speak to others the way you want to be spoken to. And look, isn't this just a reiteration of what Jesus already told us? What, what, did, Jesus, what, what did Jesus say whenever he was confronted? They, he said, they said, what's the greatest commandment? What did Jesus tell them? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, right? So this is the first commandment with promise, but the second one's likened to it. What was it? Love your neighbor as yourself. Speak to others the way you want to be spoken to. Sounds so elementary, but I'm going to tell you what, that's PhD level hard. Speak to others the way you want to be spoken to. Because here's one thing I know about every one of you. You love yourself. Don't you? I love myself. Sometimes I walk around the house, I kid my wife about that. I say, hey baby, I love myself. Right? Let's all say it together. You ready? Go. I know, even if you didn't say it, I know it's true. I know you do. And see, that's why we were given this command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Speak to your neighbor as you want to be spoken to. Listen, there's no rewind button when it comes to your words. You can't put them back in. But you can make a big old mess when you open your mouth at the wrong time saying the wrong thing. Ask God, ask the Holy Spirit of God today to help you. Maybe you need to go to someone and say, I'm sorry. I've messed up with my tongue. And it may not fix it right away. It might take time to heal. Make those things right today because, listen, there is no rewind button when it comes to your words. Amen? Let's pray together.